had a theology degree there, but what we're planning in September, officially, is an education degree. So it'll be a three-year education degree through um, Chester University in Chester. And then after you finish that degree, you can teach for a year in the Krishnamanti schools. I mean, you can do it in other schools also. That's available. And then you get paid by the government. And the end of that year, you become a certified teacher. And unless you're terrible, you'd have guaranteed employment in the Krishnamanti school system or in any school you wanted to do. So if any of you are, are at that point in your life and you're thinking about what you'd like to do, this will be really the first opportunity where we'll be providing a professional level government salary job where you can also work with devotees and of course further the mission of Lord Chaitanya. So if any of you are interested and if uh, any of you know somebody who's not here tonight who's interested, go to the Bhaktivedanta College website and fill out an application. We just had a meeting up in Chester with the university asked me, where are you going? I said to the Pandavas Sin, and I said, oh, those are the right people to tell. <laughs> All right, so what I was asked to talk about tonight is Krishna consciousness on trial. Or you want to give me a topic to talk about, and I can have to talk about that without stopping. <laughs> <laughs> you want to try that? Actually, when I was uh, being trained for extemporaneous speaking, one time I was given the topic, pickles and bikinis. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to talk about that. So we were looking at two categories of doubts that we might have about spiritual life. One is the goal, and one is the process. So we might wonder, well, is there such a thing as spiritual life? Is there such a thing as enlightenment and love of God? Does it really exist? Maybe it's just some sort of electrical impulses in the brain. You know, maybe there isn't anything like enlightenment. Maybe this world is all there is and material success and material goals is all there is. And the people who talk about spirituality, they're just deluding themselves. You know, that's what Marx thought, right? Religion is the opium of the people. It's just some sort of, just some sort of thing that when people trudge through life, they can think, wow, ah, there'll be something at the end. So how do we know that spiritual realization whatever you want to call it, but realizing ourself, realizing God, realizing Krishna, attaining to a state of unlimited, ever-expanding bliss and knowledge forever, no longer having to reincarnate in this world and go through our different bodies and different experiences. So how do we know that's real? Well, of course, how do you know anything's real? I suppose the only way you can absolutely know it's real is by experiencing it yourself. So I would give two evidences for that. First of all, there are a lot of people, maybe not a large percentage, but there's a lot of people in the history of the world who claim to have achieved enlightenment. Various levels of it, perhaps, and various flavors of it. But many of those people display the symptoms of spiritual perfection that's described in the scriptures. Now, of course, I cannot absolutely tell whether or not somebody else is enlightened. I mean, I can't absolutely tell whether or not someone else is angry. If they come in the room and slam the door and put their fist through the wall, you know, and throw their books on the floor and start yelling and screaming and get red in the face and jumping up and down, I can pretty much safely assume that they're angry, but you know, they might not be. It's possible that they're not. I can't access the inner state and inner consciousness of another person. So I can't say that I know for sure that other people have attained spiritual perfection, but we can say that throughout history there have been a goodly number of people, certainly not, certainly a small percentage of the population, but a goodly number of people who've exhibited the symptoms of being a self-realized and a God-realized and an enlightened being. And those people have existed in all different cultures and all different religions. So we have that. We have that 
There are great ancient traditions of the world that teach that enlightenment is possible, that transcendental realization is possible. And they describe people in ancient history who also attained such states. Now, of course, that's a little bit more removed. There's not people whose symptoms that we can see. It's just historical records. So we've got that kind of evidence that there are a goodly number of people who claim to have achieved such perfection and to display symptoms that indicate to us that they probably have. We have the descriptions of such persons going back throughout history. Then we also have the fact that all of us, everybody, wants it. Everybody wants to be happy unlimitedly. Nobody wants happiness to end, right? Or get boring. Most of the things we enjoy in this world get boring. If ice cream for breakfast, and ice cream for lunch, and ice cream for dinner, and ice cream for breakfast, and ice cream for lunch, and ice cream for dinner, and ice cream for breakfast, and ice cream for dinner, it gets boring. The amount, the amount of happiness you get from it decreases, and after a while it can even be revolting. <coughs> And then it has an end. You know, there's a limit as to how much ice cream you can eat at one time. You have to stop. And if you keep trying to eat ice cream past your limit, you won't even enjoy it anymore. But that's not what we want. We want something that every time we experience it, it gets better. And we don't want there to be an end. And we also want full knowledge. We really want to understand things. We love that aha moment of understanding. Wow, oh yeah, I get that. <laughs> and the more you go on in life, the more you see that no matter how much, you know, you how much you study, how much you go to school, how many degrees you get, how many books you've read, how smart you are, you can only know a tiny, 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 tiny fraction of what there is to know. Your ignorance is always going to far, I mean, not even any comparison. the relationship between your knowledge and your ignorance. But that's what we want. We want to understand everything. We want to understand why do I do what I do? Why do other people do what they do? What's the meaning of the universe? How does everything work? And we also want to be really fully alive. We don't want to just live. We want to live a life of vitality. And, and health and youthfulness. You know, it's really funny when my hair started turning gray. It's kind of a gradual thing, but at one point I was getting a driver's license. I said to my daughter, what should I put down, brown or gray? And she looked at me, she said, gray. <laughs> and it's odd. It's, it's very odd because all my life I filled out these little forms, you know, brown. What happened? You know, you, I, I really, I didn't think it would happen to me. I really didn't, and you don't think it'll happen to you. You think you'll always look in the mirror and it'll always be black. It won't. You know, people say to me, oh, you lost weight. I said, no, gravity's just pulling on my face. <laughs> and you don't think it's going to happen to you, but it does. And your energy goes down. You, you, just, you just don't have the energy you had when you were young. You try to do the things you do when you were young, you just can't. The body says, I'm very sorry, that program doesn't run anymore. <laughs> so we want to be youthful and full of energy and full of vitality. Youthful energy is so attractive. That's what we want. I mean, even people who commit suicide, it's not that they want to die. They just don't know how to deal with their problems. And if you could say to a suicidal person, hey, I got some magic something, it'll cure all your problems, then they wouldn't kill themselves. We all, everybody, everybody wants unlimited happiness. Unlimited happiness that gets better and better and better. Unlimited knowledge that keeps growing and expanding. And a vibrant, youthful, healthy, energetic life. Well, those are all the symptoms of enlightenment. So that's what we all want. So one of my primary evidences for the fact that spiritual realization is real is that everybody wants it. Where would the desire come from if it didn't exist? If this was all there was, if all there is 
is you just grow up, you go to school, you get married, you have kids, you get a job, you make some money, you get a house, you get a car, you get a big flat screen TV, you get a bigger car, your kids grow up, you get you know more advanced in your profession, and they put your name in the newspaper, and everybody goes, or something that you did. You know, and then you get old, and you get sick, and you walk around with a cane, and people give you a chair to sit on because out of respect, and then you die, and your name's in the newspaper, and you have somewhere between two sentences if you're an ordinary person, and five paragraphs if you're a special person, and then everybody forgets about you after about 20 years. If that was all there was, where would these other desires come from? Why would we have them? And they're universal. It's not just that I want unlimited happiness and you're just satisfied. And you say, well, I actually don't care. So if it, if it wasn't, if it didn't exist, if it wasn't our birthright, we wouldn't feel that way. We wouldn't be striving for it. I mean, even if you give up and you say, well, nobody can be happy all the time anyway, I just have to deal with it. It's, but that's still what we want. I may look in the mirror and resign myself to the fact that my mother's face is looking back out at me. But it's not what I want. I don't like it. You understand? I accept it because I don't have a choice. I don't like it. I don't like it that the ice cream gets boring and that I can only eat a certain amount of it. I don't like that. I want to be able to eat, you know, 20 pieces of burfi. <laughs> and 400 containers of ice cream. I don't want it to have to stop. So that for me is one of the main evidences that it's real. That it's something that must actually exist, because we want it. You know, there are creatures in the desert that are designed not to drink water, so they don't feel thirst. But if you put us in a desert, we'll feel thirsty, because we're designed to drink water. So we're all hankering for something that's spiritual and real. Another way you can tell that it's real is if you practice a genuine method, you will experience at least a little taste of it, even at the beginning. And you can tell that it's something quite different from material experience. There's a different quality to it. And I would compare it to the sound you hear when I'm speaking through a microphone and the sound you hear if I'm just speaking loudly. So if I'm speaking loudly, or if I'm speaking through a microphone, there's a different quality to my voice, isn't there? You can hear the difference between something that's natural and something that's artificial. Or like you guys gave me that squash. And I drank it and I said, it's chemicals. I can immediately tell the difference between something that's real fruit juice and something that's chemical, copy of fruit juice. It has a different quality to it. So if you have even a very small experience of something spiritual, you immediately know it has a different quality. You can tell immediately that, oh, I'm touching something that's real. I'm touching something that's genuine. And that's another way, you can, that's the ultimate way to know that Krishna consciousness is, is, is real, by experiencing it. Now, generally, although this doesn't have to be like that, it takes many, 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 many years before one is going to attain it fully. It doesn't have to be like that. It could take a moment. It doesn't usually take a moment for various reasons. But at least even in the beginning, you can have some genuine experiences. All right, is it worthwhile? Why should you bother? Even if it's real, is it worth it? I mean, there's all kinds of cool things in this world that are real, but they're not worth it. Like I just read that, um, some big movie producer or director who just went down in the Mariana Trench. You know where the Mariana Trench is? It's the lowest spot on Earth. It's in the Pacific Ocean. Mm -hmm. So he just had someone design this special submarine. He had to be all cramped up inside of it. And he goes down in the Mariana Trench. So the guy's filthy rich. So I don't know how much it cost him, but I'm sure that it was a lot of money. So you can say, is it worth it, even if it's a really cool experience? Is it worthwhile? Because honestly, attaining Krishna consciousness is not easy. The process itself is very easy to understand. It's very simple. It's not a complicated process. But actually being willing to confront the false ego and be being willing to, to see the truth is not easy. 
It's psychologically not easy. Physically, the process we're teaching is very, very simple. It's not a difficult process. But psychologically, it is difficult. It, require, it requires some degree of honest introspection and, and inner humility, inner honesty, that most people find quite difficult. And that most people find they have to do gradually over stages and years. So is it worth it to do it? And, and my answer to that is really simple. I don't see what else is worth doing. The way I, I look at it myself is if I have even a chance, even a possibility of attaining eternal unlimited happiness and ever expanding, ever increasing knowledge and eternal vibrant life, why, why wouldn't I at least try for it? Because I know that, materially speaking, everything is doomed to failure, sooner or later. Now, I know in material life that I'm not going to get most of my desires fulfilled. Most of what I want in my life, I just, I just don't get it at all. It just doesn't happen. Or I get things and then I say, oh, why did I want that? It, it disappoints me in some way. You know, you work really, 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 really hard to achieve it, and then you say, was that it? Was that it? Is that what I worked so hard for? That's okay. It wasn't what I thought it would be. You know, it's really interesting when you graduate. I remember, I remember when, I, when I got my PhD, you know, and, and the next day I thought, you know, I'm not any smarter than I was yesterday. <laughs> I'm still the same person. And then the things that are just perfect and beautiful and wonderful in our life, we don't get to keep them. In fact, all the time we're enjoying them, we're worried about losing them. The more perfect something is, the more anxiety it puts you in. Isn't that nuts? You know, if you have something that's not what you really want, you don't really care about it, if it gets lost or broken or whatever, well, okay. I didn't really care about it anyway. But if you've got something that's great, then you're always filled with fear. If you've got a beautiful relationship, then you're always worried. You know, the person's going to die. Or they're not going to love me anymore. Are they going to run off with somebody else? Or so many things can happen. And you're always worried. Whether it's a nice relationship, whether it's a new computer, whether it's a cool pair of shoes, I don't know what it is. You know, or, or even knowledge. I could get sick or I could get hurt and my brain could stop working. It happens. So that's a zero-sum game, because materially, everything is like that. It's either unattainable, dissatisfying, or temporary. There's nothing that's attainable, satisfying, and eternal, materially. It just doesn't exist. You can't get a perfect relationship and then just keep it forever. You can't get a perfect car and just keep it forever. So I, I see that as a zero-sum game. Okay, you know, we got to play it. Here we are, we got to eat. We got to get a job, we got to get an education. But that's not, can't be the source of our happiness. So for me, it's much more worthwhile to try for, for a real and important and satisfying goal than to just say, okay, well, I'm just going to accept something that's not going to really give me what I want. Am I going to do something that I have no hope of attaining? I have no hope of attaining unlimited material happiness. It's hopeless. It's useless. Or am I going to put my energy into doing something where at least I have a chance? And at least according to Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, what's nice about the quest for enlightenment is it doesn't end with death. So if you start going for Krishna consciousness and you don't finish it in this life, you get to pick it up in your next life. That doesn't happen with material things. You know, when I take birth again, it's not that I'm going to know everything that I know now. I'm going to start off just crying and then saying gag, gag, goo, goo, and then having to learn the alphabet and language all over again. All of my extemporaneous speaking skills that you were. <laughs> and they were going to be gone. All that work I did, I have to start all over. I might still have the tendency and the interest 
And of course, in rare cases, people keep talents for a few lives. But what Krishna says is whatever you do spiritually, you do keep. You, keep, you can keep building on it. So even if you don't attain perfection in this life, it's not lost. And we actually see that. We actually see that practically with people who take up spiritual life. And you can see that some people start off at a very, very high level. For some people, attaining perfection is a very quick and easy thing because they were practically there in another life. So we see this practically. So it's certainly worth working for. Whereas materially, what you work for, you're going to lose it. It's like, I, I remember we were, we were in one house and they, we bought one house and the kitchen was really dodgy. And I had asked my husband to replace the countertop in the kitchen. Well, I went to the wedding of a friend's daughter. And when I came back, he'd gotten so enthusiastic, he'd gutted the whole kitchen. <laughs> I just came back, it was just a hole. Mm -hmm. And I remember we got in a big argument about what color to paint the wall. It was a very, very small kitchen, and most of it was, was covered with wall cabinets, so there was only a little tiny piece of wall of visible anyway. And I wanted to get lavender, and he said, nobody wants to put lavender in a kitchen. I said, it's my kitchen, I want lavender. Anyway, he finally surrendered and painted it lavender. But a year later, we moved out of the house, which wasn't our intention, long story. It wasn't our plan. We expected to live there for you know, like 30 more years. We moved a year later, and I thought, what a stupid thing to fight about. Yeah. It doesn't matter. You don't get to keep it. Put all this effort into something, and all this concern about it, and all this attachment to it, and you don't get to keep it. And the next house we moved in, I said, just paint everything that you want. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I remember we had one person working on the house, and he said, what color do you want the kitchen tiles? I said, anything but white, so what did he do? He put it in white. <laughs> Seriously. But at that point, I thought, it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. We're just too temporarily. It really doesn't make that much difference. So everything's ultimately like that. All right, now another doubt we might have about the goal is, well, OK, so we can say generally, that spirituality is the goal. But what about what the Hare Krishna movement is teaching as the top spiritual goal? Love for Krishna in Goloka Vrindavan. Is that really the top goal? Or maybe there's something higher than that. Maybe merging into the white light is higher. Maybe worshiping Shiva is higher. Maybe worshiping Jesus is higher. How do we know? I mean, look, so, there's so many religions and so many spiritual paths. And they're all saying that spiritual perfection is the greatest thing, but they all have a different version of spiritual perfection. They all describe it differently. So how do we know what's the highest? Well, first of all, even if you end up in something that's not the highest, spiritual perfection is dynamic. It's not static. So you can still keep going on. If you end up coming to Krishna consciousness and you find out there was something higher after you achieve it, it it's not that you're stuck. It's not that, okay, now I can't attain a higher state of existence. So you don't have to worry that you're going to buy into something. And if, you know, if actually it's not true, if, if really Durga is higher, or if really merging into the Brahman is higher, then you're out of luck. No, you can still do that. You, you don't close the doors on your options. And this is true with all the religions of the world also. That anyone who attains spiritual perfection in the ultimate issue, can also move to a higher platform. So I understand that Krishna conscious is the highest thing for two reasons. First of all, from the scriptures. Of course, you can say, well, other people have other scriptures that say other things. But also just from a logical point of view. I mean, if you examine the perfections that are being taught in different religious systems and different spiritual systems, and you compare them logically, I think you will come to the conclusion that love of God and love specifically of God in his form of Krishna and Vrindavan is the highest. Now there's also a personal feeling. So some people in their perfected state would rather be with Ramachandra or rather be with Narayan. And in a sense, for those individuals, that's the highest. And even with Krishna, there's different ways of being with Krishna in perfection. 
and each of those ways is the highest for that individual. So really, the Krishna consciousness movement, in one sense, we're teaching a certain absolute as the highest. In another sense, we're saying there's gradations of what's the highest. There's differences in what's the highest for the individual. That each individual also has their own very personal, very individual highest perfection, which in the ultimate sense is actually different from that of anybody else. That the individual relationship that each of us can have with Krishna is exactly that. It is an individual relationship. And the nature of it is going to be different for each of us. At the same time, we can say, yes, there is an ultimate, highest pinnacle of spiritual perfection. And why would I say logically that, that I personally see it's the highest, in addition to the fact that it's, it's stated in the scriptures? Because it's the most intimate. It has the most room for happiness, the most room for individual and personal expression. It's the most charming. It just has the greatest range of activity and, and feeling and existence of all the different types of perfection. But we also do teach in the Hare Krishna movement that there are different levels and types of perfection, even besides Krishna Prem. You know, we don't advise merging with the light of the Brahman, but it is a type of spiritual perfection. Another type of spiritual perfection is realizing the Lord in the heart. Another is going into the kingdom of Narayan. Another is going to the kingdom of Ramachandra and going into the various spiritual abodes of Krishna, Dwarka, Mathura, Vrindavan, different relationships with Krishna. So all of these are all spiritually perfect. So we're, we're not teaching, okay, everybody has to do exactly this. Although we do say that a relationship with Krishna in Goloka Vrindavan it gives the greatest range and experience of spiritual perfection. So you might say, well, why are there various religious systems at all? You know, if there's one absolute truth, why don't all the religions teach that? Well, that's just like saying, first of all, why are there many different schools? And why do the schools teach things a little differently? And why do different schools offer degrees in different subjects? And why are there different levels of schools? Why are there nursery schools and primary schools? and secondary schools, and undergraduate programs, and graduate programs. Why aren't all schools just PhD schools? Well, because not everybody's ready for that. And then everybody's interested in that. Some people want to become an auto mechanic, and some people want to become you know, a brain surgeon. There's different desires. And knowledge is knowledge. It's not that the, the nursery school is teaching falsity. I mean, there may be some bogus schools that just say, you know, pay 100 pounds, we'll give you a degree. So there are some false religions, too. There definitely are false religions. But among the genuine religions, some of them are operating at different levels. Some of them are operating at a nursery level. Some of them are operating at an undergraduate level. Now, of course, we know sometimes there's a person in primary school who's functioning at a PhD level in mathematics. It happens. Sometimes it happens. And there are people in PhD programs who are acting like children. <laughs> that happens too. So there are people in elementary systems of religion who become fully self-realized. And there are people in very high systems of religion that are acting like materialists. It's not that everybody in the highest system is on the highest platform, and it's not that everybody in the lower system is on the lower platform. That, that is not the case. So there are different religions on one hand, because they're teaching different levels of truth. Just like in primary school, they teach you, you can only subtract a smaller number from a bigger number, right? You can't do 3 minus 5. You have to do 5 minus 3. And when you're 8 years old and you try to do 3 minus 5, they'll say, no, that's wrong. You can't do that. But when you're in secondary school, you can do that. And in real life, you can do that. People do it all the time. It's called debt. <laughs> You know, but when you're, when you're eight years old, they'll say, no, you can't do that. So on one hand, it's true. Yeah, you can't. But on the other hand, it isn't true. So there's levels of truth. And the other reason there's different religious systems is, frankly, different people are ready for different things at different times, different ways of understanding the truth. And different people are attracted to different aspects of the truth. 
What we're teaching in the Krishna Consciousness Movement is that the absolute truth is not a mathematical formula. The absolute truth is a person. And even in this world, there's an unlimited number of ways you can have a relationship with a person. If I say to describe the microphone, we could all come up with a pretty identical description. But if I say to describe you, we're not all going to come up with an identical description. Because it depends on our relationship. So everyone's going to see the absolute truth somewhat differently. All right, now, will attaining spiritual enlightenment, will it mess up your life? Now, there's a lot of people who will tell you it will. A lot. Even people who are interested in religion and spirituality. You know, I remember my mother saying, I'm glad you're religious, but you know, it's too much. Why does it have to be an all-encompassing thing? Of course, especially when I joined the Hare Krishna movement, what that meant was you left everything and you went and lived in the ashram. You know, I wasn't even sure could I bring pimple cream and shampoo. <laughs> <laughs> I gave my car back to my father. That was probably a good thing. But people will think like that. Well, if you go for spiritual enlightenment, what does that mean? Well, that means that you know you drop out of school, you leave your family, you go to a cave in the Himalayas, you stop eating, you stop functioning in society. I mean, look, it can mean that. It's not that. It, it's not that that cannot be also dedicating yourself to spiritual life. It can mean that. It can mean that you put everything else aside in your life and you just go live in an ashram as a sannyasi, whether with the title of sannyasi or not. And there are people who do that. Now, of course, most people who do that can't maintain it long term. But there are people who do it and do maintain it long term. And that's fine. But that's not required. It's not that to attain spiritual perfection it means that you can't get a good education, you can't get a good job, or you can't have a nice family and a nice house and a nice car and all those things. And frankly, the vast majority of people who attain spiritual perfection are also competent material people. I mean, Srila Prabhupada was a competent businessman. He ran, ran a ph pharmaceutical business. <laughs> I was just reading in a book by Mukunda Maharaj, Mukunda Swami, who was one of the first people to join the Hare Krishna movement in 1966, and he was saying that he and his friends were going to visit Srila Prabhupada, and they were talking about, well, what do you think Prabhupada thinks about drugs? And one of the guys says, well, he said he used to deal drugs. <laughs> and, uh, and Mukunda was saying, I don't think so. Anyway, later he found out that Prabhupada had run a pharmaceutical company. <laughs> But he was a very competent businessman. You know, he had a wife, he had five children, he had a very successful business. And Srila Prabhupada, even as a renunciate, even as a, as a sannyasi, he was a very materially competent person. He was a very good manager. He was, a, he was very good with the accounts. He was very responsible with money. He kept track of every penny that he spent on anything. He was very good at dealing with people. He was a very materially together person. Or we read about the six Goswamis of Vrindavan, you know, they were writing so many books. Some of them were acting as counselors and advisors to all the people in, the, in Vrindavan. So generally speaking, even people who attain spiritual perfection, they don't become materially incompetent. There are some people who attain enlightenment and just shut out the world and have nothing to do with the world and appear to the world almost as, as mad. That is true, but that's, a, that's an exception. We can talk about why do some people do that, but that's another discussion. But factually, becoming enlightened should make you more competent because it clears your vision. It lets you see things as they are. It lets you see things in truth. You know, we all have so many decisions we want to make in our lives, and we never know the results of our decisions. Should I study this thing or that thing? Well, I don't know what will happen if I study this thing or that. You know, you can go to your advisor and say, well, I, if I study this, will I get a good job? But they can't promise you that. I mean, we don't know if we get in a car, we're going to be in an accident. We don't know what the results of our decisions are going to be. 
and it's so weird. I, just the other day, I ended up meeting some very old and dear friends of mine at Govinda's restaurant in Soho. And if I had come downstairs two minutes later, I would have missed them. And what were the series of events that lead me to come downstairs exactly when I came downstairs? How do I know what decisions I'm making in my life are important and what are not important? I might think, well, where I go to school and what I study and who I marry and where I live, those are the really big decisions. But maybe the really big decision is whether I get in the car five minutes now or five minutes later. Maybe that's really going to affect my life a lot more even than who I marry. I don't know. I don't even know what's going to be good for me. Sometimes I think, well, oh, if I do this, oh, it'll really be good for me. And I do that and it's terrible for me. Sometimes I think, oh, if I do this, I'll be terrible. And I do it as wonderful. So if one comes to spiritual consciousness, one gets clear vision. One can see things as they are, which means that one can make intelligence decisions even for a material thing. All right, so those are some doubts about the goal. You know, we looked at, does it exist? Is it worth it? Is it the top goal? And is it going to have all sorts of negative consequences for me? All right, now let's say that we accept, yes, you know, I want to become spiritually enlightened. I want eternity, knowledge, and bliss. I want to find out who I am. I want to rise above the material coverings. Or even, you know, I really want to fall in love with Krishna and Vrindavan. And it's the most worthwhile thing to do. It's the topmost goal. There's nothing higher than that goal. And there's not going to be any downsides to it. Whatever I'm going to lose is going to be stuff that I want to get rid of anyway. The only thing I'm going to lose is, you know, the rubbish in, in the rubbish bin. I'm not going to lose anything valuable. All right, now what about the process? There are people who are going to teach different processes to attain spiritual perfection. And of course, Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita teaches a number of spiritual processes. He teaches a, a process of karma yoga, where you do your activities in the world for the purpose of purification. He teaches jnana yoga. Uh, Gyan yoga and Dhyan yoga are what a lot of people think of a spiritual life. And that is where you basically give up activities in the world, you become a recluse, you live in a, you know, a monastery or a convent somewhere. In Gyan yoga you spend your time studying and praying, in Dhyan yoga you spend your time meditating. So Krishna talks about those three different processes, and of course there are varieties and permutations of them. I'd say that most religious systems in the world today the general people teach some sort of variety or some sort of understanding of karma yoga. But a lot of them aren't even teaching that. A lot of them are really just teaching pious work in the world, which is not spiritual at all. It's, it's completely within the realm of material activity. That's just, you know, be a nice person, do good to others, which, which is all wonderful things. But if that's all you're doing, it's not spiritual be a righteous person, you know, help people in need. That's included in spiritual life, but if that's all you have, we say it's necessary but not sufficient. You all know what that is from logic? You know, it's necessary but not sufficient. So, you know, if you're going to be dressed, you have to wear a shirt, but that's not enough. So that's something like necessary but not sufficient. So why is bhakti the best process? And we would say bhakti is the best process because it gets to the root of the whole situation immediately. Whereas these other processes are getting to it slowly and indirectly. They work. They're genuine processes. We're not saying that bhakti is the only genuine process. Karma yoga, jnana yoga, and dhyana yoga, and the different ways they're presented and the different varieties of those. Those are all genuine processes to attain spiritual perfection. But they're riskier and they're slower and they get, at the, they get at the real issue indirectly. The real issue is that I'm seeing myself as separate from Krishna, even though I'm not separate from Krishna. I'm seeing an illusion. I'm seeing things that are different from what they really are. And I want to change my consciousness to see that actually I'm part of Krishna. Not part of Krishna in the sense that I am him. Part of Krishna in the way you're part of a family, or the way you're part of someone you love, or you're part of an organization, or you're part of a country. And I'm part of Krishna, and, and my real place is having my relationship with Krishna. And you're going right there. <laughs> you're going right to my relationship with Krishna. You're going right to meditating on Krishna. 
So some people may have some doubts as to, well, why is, why is it so hard? Why does bhakti yoga seem to be so difficult? If it's the easiest, fastest, most natural process, you know, why is there some struggle? And the reason there's some struggle is because we've gotten ourselves into an unnatural position. Just like if someone's a drug addict or an alcoholic, you know, it's a struggle or even addicted to cigarettes or something. It's, a di it's difficult to give up the habit. So if you've never become addicted to something, it's not difficult to go without it. You know, I, I've never thankfully been addicted to anything. So I don't have a problem. I don't wake up in the morning saying, where's my cigarette, where's my drink, where's my drugs? It's easy for me to go without those things because I never had any kind of, of attachment to them. You understand? I don't even think about it. But once somebody develops an attachment to something, the process of giving it up generally, not always, but generally, is difficult. So what's difficult is that I've started to rely on this thing for my sense of identity and my sense of happiness. And I'm afraid to give it up. Even if it's causing me suffering. I think all of us have some sort of bad habits or some sort of behaviors that we know are not good for us and we know they hurt us, but we, we become habituated to it. And we're afraid to give it up. We're afraid if we give it up, there'll be a hole in our life. And I'm sure we've also had experience that sometimes when we give those things up, we're like, wow, that's so nice. Why did it take so long to do that? Why was I resisting it so much? So that's really what bhakti is about. In the beginning of bhakti, it's about getting rid of stuff. And once you've gotten rid of enough stuff, your focus becomes more on becoming attached to Krishna. Of course, even in the beginning, the reason we get rid of stuff is out of attachment to Krishna. But if you think of it, like let's say you had a guest room in your house that you hadn't cleaned for a long time, and someone you really liked and really care about was coming to visit and you were going to put them in that room. So you were cleaning the room because you wanted to make a place for them. You weren't cleaning the room for the sake of cleaning the room. Things like karma yoga, gyan yoga, dan yoga, you're cleaning the room for the sake of cleaning the room. Bhakti yoga, you're cleaning the room for the sake of your relationship with Krishna. So you're cleaning the room because you want to make your guests happy. But if the room is really filthy, then in the beginning you're probably just focusing on getting rid of the filth. At a certain point, as you start seeing more and more of the room, then you, you sort of shift, isn't it? So it becomes, at first it's kind of difficult. When you look at this real filthy room and you might be a little overwhelmed, right? And even though you've done a lot, there's still a lot more to do and it can be discouraging. But once you get to a certain point, whatever it is, you know, you're, if you're half done or you're three quarters done, and you can really start seeing what it's going to look like when it's finished. And pretty soon your guest is going to come. And they're starting to call you and say, I'm just a few blocks away. You know, the nature of the work starts to change. So bhakti is happiness from the beginning. Because we're thinking from the beginning that Krishna's coming. And from the beginning he calls us occasionally and says, I'm on the way. You know, we get some response from him even in the beginning, at least periodically. But it is hard also. There's no question that it is hard because we have all these attachments. And attachments mean that we're attached to them. Attachments mean that we have, we have lost our ability to see them for what they are. I'm sure we all know with our friends and family members what sort of foolish things they're attached to that they'd be much happier if they stopped doing or if they changed. Whatever it may be. A way of dealing with other people, a way of managing their life, I'm sure. Anyone we know well, we can look at them and say, wow, if they would only make this little change, how much happier they'd be. And we often find the person is very resistant, isn't it? Sometimes you can't even talk to them about it at all. Sometimes you can't even bring it up. Why? Because they're attached. So we all have those things. It's the same for us, that our friends and family members and people that we love, they look at us and they say, wow, you know, if only this person would make this little change, they'd be so much happier. 
So the reason that bhakti is hard in the beginning is we're dealing with attachments that we're not seeing honestly. We're not seeing ourselves honestly. We're not seeing our attachments honestly. And generally, not always, it doesn't have to be, but generally it takes a while of practicing bhakti before one's willing to look at oneself honestly and say, what do I need this thing? And by this thing, I don't necessarily mean a thing. I may mean just pride, or greed, or lust. I don't necessarily mean you have to get rid of your car. You follow? You have to get rid of that pair of shoes you really like. The things that we really need to get rid of are, are things like envy, and greed, and pride, and, and lust. And, which in the beginning of bhakti, we don't even know that we have. And as you practice bhakti, you, the vision clears and you go, ooh, <laughs> what am I holding on to here? You know, if I really like Krishna, I think I better get rid of this. It stinks. But that's why, it's, that, that's why it's hard in the beginning. And if we're willing to face our attachments, if we're willing to deal with them honestly, then bhakti goes quite quickly. And the main way of being willing to do that is focusing on how wonderful Krishna is. Focusing on the goal, not focusing on the on the cleaning job. You know, how do you get through school? You focus on the goal, isn't it? If you focus on, oh, I gotta study for this exam, then you don't wanna do it. You're saying, okay, I'm doing this for the sake, but what's my purpose? And some people are saying, well, why, why do people give up on bhakti? And I think there's many reasons why people give up. Of course, whatever you do is there eternally. One reason people give up is early on in the cleaning out process, they just go, I can't do it, it's too much. Now you can do it and it's not too much, but sometimes one, one might think like that in the beginning of a big job. Another reason might be a lot of materialistic association. If you're hanging around a lot with materialistic people or listening a lot to materialistic propaganda, it's not so much that we'll change our mind from a logical or experiential point of view, but the modern materialistic society is set up in such a way that if you're interested in spiritual life, you feel like an outcast and you feel like a fool. The propaganda is people who are into spiritual life, they're weird. There's something wrong with them. And we all want to be socially accepted. So if we hang around a lot with materialistic people, if we read and hear and see a lot of materialistic things, then even though we have very real spiritual experiences and even though intellectually we know that spiritual life is true our need to fit in with other people may trump that so therefore if you want to stay in bhakti one needs to have some association of people who encourage you and someone else asked well why is the process gradual i think i already talked about that the process can be very, very fast if you're willing to look at the truth and deal with it. It can be a very fast thing. But generally, our willingness to see the truth and deal with it is a very slow process. That's what it's like for most of us. And I think if we can admit that and say, you know, I'm not really comfortable facing everything in myself now, uh, then just kind of accept that. That, well, if, it's, if I'm not going to be comfortable with it, then Krishna's going to take me at the level at which I'm comfortable. You can always ask Krishna, Krishna, take me as fast as I can handle blissfully and happily. <laughs> I would not suggest you ask Krishna to accelerate it absolutely. I, 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 and most of us have done this, by the way, so I speak from experience. But I, I would not suggest you go to Krishna and say, okay, Krishna, I just want spiritual perfection and pure devotion immediately. I don't want anything else. What he'll do is he'll say, oh, really? <laughs> and you pretty much go, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I tried that twice. Don't ask me why I did it twice. <laughs> now, you want to get to the point that you'll actually be able to say that, honestly. You want to get to the point that you go to Krishna and say, Krishna, all I want is spiritual perfection. I don't care what the cost is. 
I've lost my concern as to whether or not I'll be a materially competent person and whether or not other people will like me and whether or not I'll get a good job and I don't care. Even if I have to sacrifice all that for enlightenment, I don't care, I'll do it. To the point that you really can say that honestly. Of course, you're not going to be asked to make that kind of sacrifice, most likely. But if you want to accelerate the process, you can ask Krishna. You can say, take, take me on as fast of a ride as I can handle. And then you'll see if you mean it. And if you mean it, then it'll go like that. If you take it as an adventure. You ever been on a really fast ride of any kind? Anybody ever been on a really fast ride of any kind? It could be fun, right? That's a little scary. But it's fun, right? So you have to take it like that. If you're just scared, but if you take it as fun, you get a good driver. So you get a good driver. Or like a roller coaster, you know, as long as you're like dope in it, it's okay. So if you want to accelerate the process of bhakti, you can. You definitely can. Accelerating the process of bhakti does not necessarily mean that I drop out of school and I drop out of job and I leave everybody and I go live in the ashram or I go to Vrindavan and I just chant 64 rounds a day. It, it might mean that. But that certainly doesn't have to be at all. And you could do all those things and not have very fast bhakti at all if you were holding on to all of your attachments. It's impossible to do all that very superficially. Difficult, but it certainly is possible. Accelerating the process of bhakti basically means I'm willing to see the truth. And I'm willing to deal with it. Because the truth is that Krishna is wonderful, and he's beautiful, and he's exciting, and he's fun. And I'm also wonderful, beautiful, and exciting, and fun, I'm a soul. And I fell into the sewer, and I'm really dirty, and I'm really sticky, and I need that. Yeah, so if we're willing to see that, without, without shame and guilt and, and angst, which all come from pride anyway, then you can go very fast. Oh, someone asked a question, because we were asking questions before. That if Krishna really wants us to come, why does he keep pushing us away? I don't think Krishna pushes us away, ever. But he does know when and how to show himself to us. He's a very expert teacher. He knows what is the, what is the proper way to, to show us what and when when we're actually ready for things. So we might think we're ready for something sooner than we're actually ready for it. All right, I hope this was interesting. <laughs> okay, any comments, questions, discussions? As soon as my ride comes, I'm going. I can take any questions or discussions until my ride comes. Yes. How do you provide the kind of like motivation for your caring on this process, even though you know you're looking forward to some you know, some wonderful thing at the end, but sometimes you get you hit sort of like an you know, end or something? How do you pick yourself up, you know, to carry yourself forward? Mm. So good friends who are helping you know, how call your friends over. Put on some music you like and call your friends over. So you should do bhakti in the association of other devotees. And with the focus on the, it's very nice to focus on the mission of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Sri Prabhupada. Not just to focus on my own cleaning business. You know, I'm cleaning as part of the mission. Not to make it just self-centered. And then it's, Almost entirely, but it's almost just something that happens more or less on that. You know, if you've got a big project going on, if there's some big event 
and you may be working really hard. But because you're excited about the event and with other people and there's a celebration, it doesn't feel like that. So if you're very absorbed in the, in the preaching mission and you're very absorbed in helping to spread Krishna consciousness and helping Srila Prabhupada with his mission, then your own personal internal advancement is just sort of part of that. And have good friends. And how, you know, what is our cleaning process? Our cleaning process is dancing and singing and delicious food and fascinating books of philosophy and times of sitting down and having quiet meditation and taking some time away from the hubbub and the stress and the <laughs> and just just being with Krishna and his name. Now, we don't do things like wear hair shirts and put rocks in our shoes. Just live under the water. So when it's part of that process, I mean, there are sometimes, there are sometimes when you'll see stuff in the heart, you go, oh, wow. And you may even cry. But that's not a bad thing. Even for God. Not a bad thing. Not a bad thing to cry to Krishna and say, Krishna, wow. What did I do? <laughs> but it's generally, it's in, the, it's in the context of something very joyful. Thank you. It's not a solitary, it's not a solitary activity. I mean, you could make it that way, but it's not very effective. And, yeah. Something else? Yes. Hi, Krishna. Thank you. Um, why must there be so many rules and regulations? And, and like, if you can't follow all the rules, and, um, well, if you kind of don't follow them, then just then you're. I'm not sure what I'm trying to say, but like, why must there be so, it's like so many rules and regulations? And well, there's not really so many. I don't know. When I first came, I thought there were so many. So maybe there really are so many. <laughs> I don't think of it anymore. It's just become part of my life. Okay, let's say, let's say you've got two people who are married and one of them cheats on the other, okay? So let's say the woman goes out and has like 20 affairs. And then she comes back to her husband and she says, I'm really sorry. So what would the husband say? Okay, come on back in. What would he do? What would he do? Break up. No, he's not going to break up. He wants her back. He still loves her. Sleep on the couch. He'd tell her to sleep on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think he'd give her some rules to follow to prove that she was sorry? Right? Yeah, he might say sleep on the couch, or he might even say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to let you in the house right now. You know, you can go stay with your mother for a while. I'll see you on Sundays from 2 to 3. I'll meet you on Sundays from 2 to 3 at this restaurant, and we can talk there. Right? He may set up some parameters. He's going to let her back in gradually. He's going to see. How does she behave? And is, is it going to be a, immediately an intimate relationship, or is it going to be more formal? It's going to be more formal. Of course, in the beginning, he'll probably be really happy. Why don't you come back? In the beginning of Krishna consciousness, Krishna gets very happy. And often when people first take up Krishna consciousness, they get strong experiences, strong spiritual experiences. And then Krishna says, okay, let's see. If you really want your relationship back, this is what you have to do. I mean, I'm dealing in my life with this one girl who told me she wanted to be my friend and told me she wanted to help me with things. And she very much misused her dealings with me. And I told her over a long period of time, you know, this is the way I want to be treated. This is the way I want to be respected. I don't want you calling me at this time of the day. I don't want you coming by this time. If you try to contact me and I tell you I'm busy, then I want you to, to stop. I want you to keep, you know, don't keep trying to chat with me over the computer if I'm busy. 
said what I thought were very simple things. And she wouldn't respect it. She just wouldn't respect it. So finally, I had to just kind of cut things. But I said, okay, if you want to deal with me, and I started giving her rules. You understand? I said, if you want to have any dealings with me, you're going to have to do this and this. And what happened, and then she would break that. <laughs> it, just, it was a recurring thing, and she would break it. And every time she broke it, I would move back. Now, what she doesn't realize, I don't know why she doesn't realize it, is if she did the things I asked her to do, I'd start to trust her. And I would open the door more. She wants me to open the door without doing those things. I'm not going to. So what's hard for us to grasp is that we're the offenders with Krishna. It's a very hard thing for us to grasp. We're the ones at fault. This isn't a relationship where there's fault on both sides. We're at fault, and we're the one. It's not so much that I have that faith in Krishna. Krishna has that faith in me. He has to see that, that I'm for real, that I'm not going to try to use him or exploit him. I mean, look, most religious people are just trying to exploit God. OK, God, I want this, and I want this, and I want this, and I want this. Give me a good grade on my exam, and cure my aunt's cancer, and give me a lot of money. and. You know, okay, God, I don't like the way you're running the universe. Let me tell you how to do it, <laughs> at least for my life. Okay, thanks, God. See ya. You didn't give me what I want? Oh, I'm not going to worship you anymore. You gave me what I want? Okay, great. I'm done worshiping you. I'll come back when I want something else. I remember I was taking a walk up by Bhaktivedanta Manor with Kalunga and kind of you know. We were taking a walk and chanting, and this one woman came to us and asked us for directions. And Kalangana said, oh, you can just walk with us, and we're, we're also going that way. And then Kalangana starts telling this woman that she should chant Hare Krishna. And the, the woman said, why? She said, I'll pray to God if I have a problem. If I don't have a problem, why should I talk to him? So at a certain point, there are no more rules. But that has to come from Krishna's side. He has to be the one to then open the door and say, okay, now I trust you. There is a point in higher stages of bhakti where the rules are irrelevant. And people on that stage may still follow the rules to set an example, and also because it doesn't really matter to them anymore if they follow them. But not always. So you know, sometimes people in those state and that stage, as I say, sometimes they live separate from society and they don't seem to follow any rules. They don't need to anymore. But usually they still follow the rules, just it doesn't feel like following the rules to them anymore. It's not they're not experiencing them that way. But that's how are you going to show Krishna that actually you're serious? Just with some emotional display? And that wouldn't convince me. This girl's tried that with me many times. Just kind of be, oh, I'm so sorry. I said, what exactly did you do wrong? And I'll even tell her she could just repeat it. I said, what you did wrong is I asked you not to call me when I was working at the school, and you did. But it was important. So I asked you not to call me when I was working at the school, even if it was important. Well, I didn't think it was a big deal. But I told you it was a big deal. <laughs> well, I don't think you should take it that seriously. But I asked you not to do that. You understand? So I don't just want the, yeah, it's so 
What I'd like her to do is say, you know, Ermina, I realize I haven't been treating you with any, you know, just basic, basic human courtesy. And I may not understand why you don't want to, why you don't want me to call when you're in a meeting. I may think it's fine to call you in a meeting to ask you if I should buy a red or blue or dunga, because it's very important and I should be able to interrupt your meetings for questions like that. And, and I don't understand why that bugs you. And I, you know, I think you're being unreasonable. But if that's the way you feel about it, then I'm going to respect you, and I'm not going to call you when you're in your meetings. And I realized that my calling you when you were in your meetings was showing a lack of consideration for you as a person, a lack of respect for you as a person, so you couldn't trust me. Do you follow? That's what I wanted to say. And I wanted to say, from now on, I'm just, I'm not gonna call you when you're in your meetings. And I'll do that, you know, as long as you want. So that's the kind of thing we have to say to Krishna. We have to say to Krishna, I'm really sorry. And I'm going to follow your rules in the scriptures. And I'm going to follow them until you tell me I don't need to follow them. I may not understand all of them. I may not understand why you think it's important. To me, it may seem petty and foolish. Like this girl, she thought that my not wanting to be disturbed in an important meeting to ask, be asked about whether she should buy a red or blue or not. She thought that was an unreasonable Request on my part. So we often think that, because maybe for her that wouldn't bother her. You understand? Maybe she's not disturbed by it. Maybe if she's in a meeting, she just says, oh, I got a phone call, and she goes out and says, sure, you know, yeah, get the blue one. So she, she couldn't relate to how I was So maybe I can't relate to how Krishna's Maybe I don't understand why is Krishna saying, hey, can you spend a couple hours with me every day? We might say, Krishna, why is it important that I spend a couple hours with you every day? Can we just skip today? I have more important things to do. And Krishna's saying, look, I really would like you to spend a couple hours with me every day. Well, can I just do it sometimes? Can I just do it when I feel like it? And we may not understand why he's saying, well, I'd really like you to do it every day whether you feel like it or not. If you want to have a relationship with me again, then I'd like you to spend a couple hours with me every day whether you feel like it or not. And whether or not you have more important things to do or not. And what is this about having more important things to do anywhere? I thought you wanted your relationship with me is your most important thing. You know, so we may not get that. You might say, well, why is it so important to me? Why does he care? Why do I have to do it every day? Can I just do it when there aren't any exams? You know, can I just call him up when I feel like it? When I'm bored and I have nothing else to do? You know, I may not get it. But that's respect. At a certain point, he'll be convinced that, okay, you really mean it. And he just opens the door and lets you back in, and everything else is forgotten. And there's my ride. I now turn into a pumpkin. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. If I said anything that you don't like, please ignore it. <laughs> I hope I said at least one or two things that you find useful and you can take on board. All right, Krishna.